shortly before dawn on Thursday, March 21st, 1918. 6,000 German guns erupted across the rolling chalklands of the Somme in northern France. This massive artillery attack devastated a 40-mile stretch of the Western Front held by the British Army and was the most concentrated bombardment that the world had ever known. As the hurricane barrage lifted, thousands of specially trained German soldiers, known as storm troops, leapt from their trenches and into the attack. On the other side of the wire, the stunned British defenders desperately reached for their gas masks as the German bombardment overwhelmed them. The great German spring offensive had opened. For the opposing commanders, it was a desperate gamble. They knew that failure could bring about ultimate defeat. It was to be a battle between German General Erich Ludendorff and his opponent, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig. By the end of 1917, the British, French, and German troops fighting on the Western Front were exhausted after more than three years of deadlock and bloody sacrifice. Throughout this time, the line of trenches stretching from the North Sea to the Swiss border changed little. Heavy casualties were causing growing disillusion in Germany. A tightening Allied naval blockade exacerbated the situation. Food stocks were running low. Raw materials were growing scarce. By the winter of 1917, German Chief of Staff Erich Ludendorff realized that drastic measures were needed to save Germany from defeat. He was aware that the supply of German manpower to replace the enormous casualties was running low and that the morale of his troops was falling. Worse, America entered the war on April 6, 1917. Increasing numbers of fresh U.S. troops were now arriving on the Western Front to bolster the tired British and French. Ludendorff had to strike early and decisively before the Americans grew too strong. Germany's one ray of hope lay on the Eastern Front. After three years of costly defeats, the Russian army was disheartened and revolution was growing in its ranks. The prospects of Germany knocking Russia out of the war were growing brighter. Ludendorff saw this as an opportunity to reinforce his depleted troops in the West and provide them with the necessary superiority to overwhelm the Western allies. Earlier in the year, the French army suffered widespread mutinies due to heavy casualties. The British army also hit a low point in the autumn of 1917 as it struggled in the mud and rain to capture Passchendaele in Flanders. The British suffered 250,000 losses in this long, fruitless campaign. The British government began to lose confidence in Sir Douglas Haig, the Commander-in-Chief. Prime Minister David Lloyd George decided to restrict the flow of reinforcements needed to strengthen Haig's armies. The British troops in France were forced to go on the defensive. 
As 1917 came to a close, it became clear to both sides that 1918 would be a year of decision. General Erich Ludendorff was certain that Germany had only one chance to win the war. Sir Douglas Haig and his French allies sensed that Germany was likely to launch a major offensive in the West. In the meantime, opposing troops settled down to endure another winter at the front. Away from the trenches, the commanders were drawing up their plans for 1918. These plans would bring Eric Ludendorff and Douglas Haig into direct confrontation. It had been a long path up until this critical point in their lives. Eric Ludendorff was born in 1865. His background was modest. He grew up in what is now the Polish countryside near Poznan. He was commissioned into an infantry regiment and quickly established himself as a professional, intelligent, and ambitious young officer. Ludendorff's determination and irrepressible energy set him apart from his peers. General Helmut von Molke, who was to command the German army in 1914, ensured that Ludendorff rose steadily through the ranks. By the outbreak of World War I in 1914, he was a major general and commanding an infantry brigade. Ludendorff played a leading part in the capture of the seemingly secure Belgium fort at Liège during the German invasion of the West. For this, he was awarded the Pour le Mérite, Prussia's highest military honor. Later, in August 1914, he became Chief of Staff to Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg on the Eastern Front and assisted in forging the decisive victories against the Russian army in 1914 and 1915. In August 1916, as the battles of Verdun and the Somme raged on the Western Front, Ludendorff and Hindenburg became joint heads of the entire German army. The German casualties of almost a million men in these two battles were nearly devastating. In early 1917, it was Ludendorff's brave decision to shorten the German line and give up some of the territory held since 1914. In March, he withdrew his hard-pressed forces to the newly prepared defenses of the Hindenburg Line. Despite his moral courage, Ludendorff had become arrogant, inflexible, and prone to panic when military operations did not go according to plan. Douglas Haig came from a very different world. Born of a rich and influential lowland Scots family in 1861, his upbringing enabled him to move easily within the British aristocracy and royalty. After attending Oxford University, Haig joined a crack cavalry regiment. Unlike Ludendorff, he saw combat in the years before World War I in the Sudan and South Africa, distinguishing himself in both campaigns. Already a general in 1914, Haig had a meteoric rise once war broke out and within 18 months was commanding the British armies on the Western Front. Haig had an impressive military record, but was not a great communicator. He appeared dour, enigmatic, and aloof to both his political superiors and his men. Deeply religious, he was also a fervent admirer of Napoleon Bonaparte. 
Though conservative in many of his military policies, Haig had great interest in developing technology. He was enthusiastic over the development of the tank and in scientific techniques which would make artillery fire more accurate and responsive. Haig was certain that the Allies would win, but he also knew that trench warfare would claim many lives. The British politicians grew critical of Haig for the heavy losses among his troops, especially during the Passchendaele campaign. Prime Minister Lloyd George wanted to dismiss him, but Haig had no able successor. This placed the British commander under severe pressure. He also had the additional strain of having to constantly placate the self-interested French political and military leaders. As 1918 dawned, Haig and Ludendorff prepared for a decisive clash of arms. They both realized that the coming battle would not only affect their reputations, but might well decide the outcome of the war itself. On November 11, 1917, at Mon in Belgium, Ludendorff and the German High Command held a conference to decide on a plan to achieve victory in the West. The main issue was whether to launch a major attack against the British or the French. Ludendorff reasoned that France was becoming increasingly dependent on its ally. If he could eradicate the British army, France would certainly bow to Germany. Ludendorff believed that he would be able to gather sufficient troops in the West to attack and drive Haig's armies out of France. His plan was to split the British from the French by launching a massive assault aimed at the channel ports. The pressure of the growing number of American troops in France meant that Ludendorff must strike quickly, but he did have one major advantage, Russia. Lenin and his Bolsheviks had overthrown the Tsar and were determined to take Russia out of the war. In December 1917, the Russians called for peace. This was formalized by the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which brought hostilities on the Eastern Front to an end. The new situation immediately gave Ludendorff a new source of over a million combat-experienced troops for his attack in the West. He quickly transferred large numbers of these soldiers from the east. By the beginning of March 1918, he had three and a half million men, or 194 divisions on the Western Front. 67 of these were concentrated between Arras and Saint-Quentin, outnumbering the British by nearly three to one. But Ludendorff knew that quantity did not necessarily mean success. Previous offensives had relied on massive protracted artillery bombardments designed to destroy enemy defenses. They all failed. Ludendorff realized that only innovative attack methods would enable Germany to achieve victory. He believed that the answer lay with specially trained soldiers known as storm troops. 
Preceded by short but concentrated artillery barrages, the storm troops would attack the enemy trench lines. They aimed to bypass centers of resistance and break through into the enemy rear areas. From there, they would destroy headquarters, communication sites, and neutralize the enemy artillery. Ludendorff's storm troop detachments would be supported by a select group of trained field artillery units. The storm troops would be followed by battle units consisting of infantry, machine gunners, trench mortar teams, engineers, sections of field artillery, and ammunition carriers. This second echelon knew how to attack strongly defended positions. They would also repel enemy counterattacks. Speed was critical, and they couldn't afford delays. With this one two punch, Ludendorff believed that the German offensive would create a tidal wave toward breakthrough. On the other side of no man's land, Haig and his generals faced 1918 with little optimism. Given the exhaustion of their troops, he and the Allies knew that there was little choice but to hang on until the Americans could make a decisive difference to the course of the war. To hold off a likely German offensive, Haig adopted the enemy's technique that had frustrated his troops at Passchendaele, a defensive system based on depth. The defenses would be made up of a forward zone, or blue line, to blunt the initial attack. Then the battle zone, or red line, where the main fighting would take place. And finally, the rear zone, or brown line. British artillery, heavy machine guns, and infantry counterattacks on the brown line would ultimately halt any German attack that got this far. But Lloyd George restrained British reinforcements being sent to France leaving Haig with fewer men. This made his plan very difficult. Even worse, the British had been forced to take over an additional 15 miles of the Allied front from the French. Not only did this increase Haig's pressure, but it also placed him in a dilemma. He had to decide if he could risk weakening the line at any point to compensate for the extra frontage he had to defend. The British sector was held by four armies, the second in the north, the first, the third, and the fifth army in the River Somme region. General Sir Hubert Goff's 5th Army was to take over the extension of the British front. But Haig decided that he could not afford to reinforce Goff by much. Racing against time, 5th Army was left to build defenses. In early March 1918, the troops on both sides knew that the countdown had begun. Ludendorff's men were buoyed by the prospect of a decisive victory. Haig's men looked east and were filled with dread. The German troops began their final training for the March 1918 offensive in the west. They were certain that the deadlock would soon be over. One man wrote, every German soldier on the Western Front 
felt that the decision of war and peace was at hand. The preparations for the offensive had been intense. Training centers were established in each army area. All infantry divisions were given special instruction in infiltration techniques. Units already in the line were combined for the youngest, fittest, and most experienced men. These would become the backbone of the special storm troop detachments. Their principal tactics lay in surprise and speed. The stick grenade was one of their main weapons of attack. In addition, they also used flamethrowers, machine guns, and trench mortars. German gunners were trained to shoot accurate artillery bombardments using maps rather than actual gunfire to register the guns on their targets. Ludendorff's plan convinced his men that they were on the threshold of a great German victory. These men gave him their total trust. Across the wire, Haig's army was recovering from the depression after Passchendaele. That battle in 1917 changed the British soldier. He became more fatalistic, and the old solidarity was gone. One man remarked, there was still comradeship, but not the homely comradeship of the past. They grew weary about the back-breaking and endless work of digging in. The overstretched 5th Army became burdened with their new command of French defenses, which were in poor condition. Goff's defenses were now the least developed of the British line. While they needed to be well rested to man the front line, the British troops feared that the German attack would catch them off guard if they weren't constantly on alert. A British soldier wrote, after the high hopes of 1917 and its cruel disappointments, my view was that my good luck would see me through. We did not discuss it, but most men felt like that. In contrast, Douglas Haig, responsible for fighting the German offensive, put his faith firmly in God. He also firmly believed that patience, endurance, and fortitude would see his men through what was set to be their sternest test of the war. As March wore on, there was an eerie sense of foreboding. The men on both sides knew that the storm was about to break. Visiting their troops, Haig and Ludendorff each sensed that his hour of destiny had arrived. Soon after 4 a.m. on March 21, 1918, Ludendorff struck. Over 6,000 guns opened fire on the British defenses in northern France. The barrage covered a 40-mile front between the Sensé and Oise rivers. The Germans wanted to inundate the entire length of the British sector between the forward positions and the battle zone. Haig's men were dazed by the sudden ferocity of the bombardment. A gas was mixed with the explosives. They desperately reached for their gas masks and tried to peer across no man's land through the impenetrable cloud that engulfed them. 
Haig expected the attack, but not its intensity. Meanwhile, Ludendorff's stormtroops opened up gaps in their own defenses in final preparation for their attack. At 8.40 a.m., the first wave rose to their feet and crashed forward. Stormtrooper Lieutenant Ernst Junger recalled in his memoirs, the great moment had come. We advanced, and the turmoil of our feelings was called forth by rage, alcohol, and the thirst for blood as we stepped out heavily and yet irresistibly for the enemy lines. It seemed that nothing would stop this human tidal wave as it began to storm through Haig's defensive lines. The German barrage moved forward 100 yards every two to three minutes, protecting the advancing men. Bypassed by the storm troops, some British strongpoints continued to fight on until they were overwhelmed. The British guns also fought back until they were overrun or forced to withdraw by the speed of the German advance. In some places, the storm troops advanced up to five miles. Overall, March 21st was the bloodiest day of World War I and a day of great sacrifice. There were over 80,000 casualties from both sides. One of the German casualties was Ludendorff's son, a fighter pilot who was shot down and killed that afternoon. It was a very personal blow and one that affected Ludendorff deeply but it did not deter him, and he drove his armies on. More stormtroop units were thrown into the fray. The Germans continued their unrelenting progress, swamping the British defenses. By day three, they had driven the British back about 15 miles. Fifty thousand prisoners had fallen into German hands, together with hundreds of artillery guns. The German 2nd, 17th and 18th armies all enjoyed success. Haig's 5th Army seemed about to crumble and was slowly separating from 3rd Army. Ludendorff's 18th Army was opening a serious gap in the British line. An ecstatic Kaiser, believing victory to be at hand, decorated Ludendorff with the Iron Cross with golden rays, the first time it had been awarded for more than 100 years. An increasingly desperate Douglas Haig began to rush reinforcements from the northern sector of his front. But the British retreat continued. The Germans maintained their onslaught and were now threatening the vital communications center at Amiens. Haig believed that only the French could help avert total disaster. He met his French counterparts on March 26th. As a result, Marshal Ferdinand Foch became the Allied Generalissimo. Although Folk's authority was limited, his appointment ended the dangerous independence of the national commanders, ensuring closer cooperation between them. 
Ludendorff's offensive still appeared unstoppable. In less than a week, the German attack punched a hole 40 miles deep into British territory. Haig looked beaten. Ludendorff seemed to be on the brink of victory. But the tide was about to turn. By the end of March 1918, the British had been severely battered by the German offensive, but Ludendorff had not yet achieved his mission, complete breakthrough. The German losses were equal to the British, but the majority were Ludendorff's irreplaceable storm troops. His surviving troops were weary and running out of food, water, and ammunition. Exhaustion was their main enemy. As a result, they were forced to go on the defensive in some sectors. Determined to win, Ludendorff decided to launch a fresh attack. He planned to trap the northern British armies by striking northwest from Arras, taking pressure off Haig's embattled 5th Army in the south. Operation Mars was launched on March 28th. This time, Haig's troops knew what to expect and mowed down the German troops as they came forward. Ludendorff's men suffered heavy casualties with little territorial gain. Thousands more were taken prisoner. In spite of this disaster, Ludendorff remained determined to break the British he quickly prepared to mount yet another attack, this time in the north of the British sector. Operation Georgette was to take place in Flanders. It aimed to capture the vital railhead at Hasbrook and advance to the coast. Mounted on April 9th, the attack initially made excellent progress. Haig was proving to be a stubborn opponent against Ludendorff. On April 11th, as the German tide swept across Flanders, Haig issued a special order that day. There is no other course open to us but to fight it out. Every position must be held to the last man. There must be no retirement. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight on to the end. Inspired by this message, Haig's men slowed, then halted the German attack. A frustrated Ludendorff renewed his efforts in the south. By April 24th, his troops had reached the village of Villiers-Bretonneur, less than 10 miles from Amiens. The German attack on villiers bretonneux included a unique event in the history of warfare. It was the site of the first tank versus tank battle. It would feature British Mark IV tanks and one of the few German A7Vs. The A7V had a crew of 18, was armed with one 57mm gun and six machine guns. Its top speed was only three miles per hour. The British Mark IV had a similar speed, a crew of eight, and came in two versions, the male armed with two six-pounder naval guns and two machine guns, 
and the female armed with four machine guns. On the edge of the Bois La Bay, one and a half miles southwest of Villiers Bretonneur was a section of British Mark IV tanks, one male and two female. They were there to support the dug in infantry. Suddenly, an A7V lurched into view. The British tanks moved forward to engage it. The British section commander, Lieutenant Frank Mitchell, in the male Mark IV tank, fired at the German A7V, but missed. The German tank kept on coming. So did the British tanks. It then halted and opened fire, hitting both female tanks, which were forced to withdraw. But Mitchell's tank continued to advance. It fired again and again at the German tank. Eventually, the A7V was hit. The damaged German monster withdrew. This ended the first ever tank versus tank battle. British and Australian troops stopped the main German attack on Villiers Bretonneur in a brilliant counterattack. Ludendorff had failed once more. He now turned against the French, launching three more offensives in May, June, and July. But in each case, after initial successes, his troops were forced onto the defensive. American forces arrived in France and joined them in driving the Germans back. By the end of July 1918, with his final offensive blunted and his own men being relentlessly mauled, Ludendorff realized that the war was no longer winnable. Haig, Folk, and the Allies took the offensive. In August, the British, French, and American armies mounted a series of rolling attacks that ruptured the German defensive line. By the end of September, the relentless Allied assaults had broken through the Hindenburg Line and forced the Germans back over 50 miles. Despite his dogged efforts, Ludendorff's troops were exhausted and could no longer sustain a cohesive defense. By now, almost one million Germans had been killed, wounded, or captured. The Allied offensives continued throughout October, and although some pockets of resistance remained, the German army was effectively ruined. 
With crumbling armies and a homeland in turmoil, Germany surrendered and the Kaiser abdicated. The nightmare of World War I was over. After the failure of his offensives, Ludendorff was a broken man. He was removed from command in October 1918. Defeated and disgraced, Ludendorff gave his support to a former army corporal named Adolf Hitler. He believed that Hitler's extreme nationalism represented the only way for Germany to regain its honor. Ludendorff took part in Hitler's failed putsch in Munich in November 1923 and was tried for treason, but acquitted. Only later would he realize that Hitler was about to lead Germany into another abyss. Ludendorff died fearful for his country's future in 1937. In contrast, Douglas Haig became a national hero in Britain and was given many honors after the war. During his remaining years, he devoted himself to the welfare of the veterans who had fought under him. When he died in 1928, he was given an old soldier's funeral in his native Scotland. In his final years, Haig had become an increasingly controversial figure. His critics had accused him of the needless slaughter of hundreds of thousands of his troops who remained buried in France and Flanders. Nevertheless, in March 1918, Haig had passed his sternest test. He knew that if he could hang on throughout the German onslaught, he would win. In contrast, Ludendorff, having initially failed to make a decisive breakthrough, saw no other option but to continue his attacks. Ludendorff and Haig had been tested to the breaking point. Both had given it their all, but like all clashes in battle, only one general could emerge victorious. <laughs>